Good evening. We're waiting for our speaker, who, who our moderator who has just described as the runaway bride. Um, <laughs> the runaway groom, so. <laughs> <laughs> I told her that I would be terrified of the press, but I know that Jeff is much stronger than that. <laughs> so we've got, we've got all of our <laughs> ducks in a row. And um, good evening, I'm Laurie Tisch. And um, this evening is in memory of my uh, beloved father, Preston Robert Tisch. Um, and it's so great to see all of you here. First, I just want to um, welcome and introduce a couple of Aspen Institute board members are here. Are here. Um, our past chair, Bill Mayer, of, uh, past chair of the Aspen Institute. Um, <laughs> as they say to the people of the military, thank you for your service. You've done a great job. And um, I know that Mike Bezos is here, um, who is also an exemplary board member. Um, and I just had the great pleasure to meet Alice Henkin, who ran Justice and Society for many years and is, I think, a recent recipient of the Eleanor Roosevelt Legacy Award. So congratulations and welcome to you. Um, and um, and, and um, also my executive director, um, who is a partner in all that we do uh, at the foundation. I'm Rick Lufglass. Um, so, thank you all for coming. I know many of you have been here before, and I've often said, um, we started this, it's now about, Linda, five years ago? Five years ago. And our first year, not to make Jeff nervous, but our first year, our first speaker was Cory Booker. Our next speaker was <laughs> Jamie Dimon. Um, I think Wynton Marsalis won the prize that year, and like that. And after the first year, I said, well, this has been great, but I never want to do it again. How can, how can, where can we go from here? Um, and every year has been terrific. I know many of you have been here and there's never been a disappointment. And as you could see, um, Jeffrey, from upstairs, from the people upstairs, there's so much excitement about your being here. So thank you, it's such a great honor. Um, so I first met um, Jeff about four years ago, four or five years ago in Aspen when I had one of those really good ideas that parents have, which is, telling their child exactly what they should do. So my daughter who was a rec recent um, graduate of Cardozo Law School, and we have uh, Matt Diller, the dean of Cardozo here. And um, I said, I know what you should do. You should come with me to the Aspen Institute and do the, um, the Socrates program. And she said, well, mom, that's exactly what I don't want to do. And <laughs> um, But she ha wasn't making a living yet, so she did do it. Um, <laughs> without doing the reading. <laughs> um, and the first day she went and she came back and she was absolutely ecstatic and excited and guess who her professor was? <laughs> um, Jeff, Jeffrey Rose. And then she did do, she was so excited that she actually did the reading. Um, so I, I had, of course, like all of you here, had heard of uh, Jeff before that, but I really got to know him through Emily's eyes and the excitement that um, she had in, in taking your class, and especially in the areas of privacy. Um, and interestingly, I had lunch with Reynold Levy today, and I mentioned to him that you were going to be here, and um, he couldn't stop talking about your book about privacy. Um, so again, it's, it's, such, it's so exciting for you to be here. Um, I think you all know um, that Jeff is now president and CEO of the National Constitution Center, um, which is a no nonprofit institution devoted to the U.S. Constitution. Um, and that's based in Philadelphia, but that's really only one of the many things that he does. He's, are you he's still a professor at George Washington? Still a professor at George Washington Law School, and of course the legal editor of the New Republic. In addition to his essays, um, which have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the Atlantic Mo Monthly, National Public Library, he's also a staff writer for The New Yorker, and this seems to be a tradition at the Aspen Institute Starting with Walter Isaacson, you have a full-time, full-time job, and then in your spare time, you knock out bestsellers. Uh, actually, was no, that? Not bestsellers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so in Jeff's spare time, he's um, knocked out books, books about uh, Bush versus Gore on, on the Supreme Court, and um, again, the book on privacy. The the um, what is it? The un the unmet gaze. The unwanted. The unwanted gaze. The unwanted gaze um, on privacy. And um, as I said, Reynold Levy today said it's one of the most best and fascinating books he's read. So check Amazon tomorrow. <laughs> yes, please. Um, Thanksgiving. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thanks. What to bring the hostess? They probably don't need another pecan pie or another <laughs> bottle of wine. And again, tonight's moderator is Jan uh, Crawford, who also seems to keep herself pretty busy. Um, she's a CBS News and political chief legal correspondent and contributes regularly to the CBS News with Scott Pelley, um, also Face the Nation. And in her spare time, she's authored Supreme Conflict, the inside story of the struggle con for control of the United States Supreme Court, and many more, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so just a little bit about um, tonight and why I started this program with my brothers. Um, many of you in the room I know uh, were fortunate enough to know my father, um, who was a great civic leader. And when he passed away eight years ago, uh, my brothers and I were looking for a way to honor him. And we came up with this idea of conversations with great leaders. And we thought, well, what does it mean to, to be a great leader, to be a speaker here? And I, I was just thinking tonight about what some of those characteristics were. Um, you had to be successful in your field, had to be a civic leader, and had to be interesting. And like my father, had to be an all around thoroughly good guy or good gal. And on that note, <laughs> I give it to Jeffrey and Jan. Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you guys for coming out tonight. I um, am thrilled to be here. I've known Jeff many, many years uh, talking about the Supreme Court. And the most wonderful thing about, well, there's so many wonderful things about Jeff, but one of the things I always think when I talk with Jeff is I always learn something. You know, I'm sitting there covering the court and watching the arguments and reading the cases just like Jeff does, but we'll have these conversations and, you know, he'll say something that I haven't thought of or he'll bring something out that really makes a lot of sense and puts things in context. And so I was thrilled to be here tonight to have this conversation with you uh, that you guys can all participate because as you just heard, um, just from some of the things that he wrestles with daily, the issues that, that Jeff um, knows about and is familiar with and an expert in are the really the defining issues of our time. And now that he's the president and leader of the National Constitution Center, I mean, what better person to be in charge of this, breathing life into it at a moment, uh, really in our nation's history where we need to be educating people about that enduring document and what it will mean for our rights uh, going forward for next generations. Um, and I think one of the, the amazing things about the Constitution Center is that it is supposedly something, um, you don't really hear this word very often, but it's bipartisan. <laughs> How does that work? Um, you know, you think we have this great document, and yet there's so much controversy. I mean, we see it almost every uh, major Supreme Court decision where you have the smartest minds in the country arguing about what that document means. What you see as your mission for the Constitution Center and bringing it forward into the 21st century and beyond, educating a new group of leaders, how are you going to do that? Well, thank you for my favorite question, which I can't wait to answer. But first, <laughs> I really have to thank Lori for the incredible honor of appearing here in this magnificent setting here at the Roosevelt House. I'm a complete Roosevelt groupie, and to be in Franklin's <laughs> house, in the house where Sarah Delanor was right next door and had a special door where she could pop in on Eleanor at any time. And my mom is, and dad are in the front row, and if you want to know about my interest in privacy was kindled by the experience of growing up in New York in a situation similar, I think, to uh, <laughs> <laughs> not quite as grand, but uh, definitely focuses the mind. Um, I love your introduction of learning stuff from me because I feel like I've learned so much from Lori, from Emily at that wonderful seminar. She was so passionate about LGBT rights then and then went on to develop a career with that. And I got my start, this is really the, be the beginning of the answer to your question. Um, my great passion in life is moderating constitutional conversations. And I got that start at Aspen when decade, a long time ago, Laura Lauder brought me in to moderate these Socrates seminars. And just bringing people of different perspectives around a table to have a conversation without a predetermined answer and just to educate each other, I found to be one of the thrills of my life. And then I got the incredible, wait, and, but now I have to pause once more and say what a complete pleasure it is for my old friend Jan for <laughs> taking the time to come from DC for this interview. I learned stuff from you too. Jan has written the best book on the Roberts Court, Supreme Conflict. She 
is the only person who all the justices talk to on both sides of the aisle. And not she, all of them. Most, almost all. <laughs> but I will not <laughs> no. say which one or what. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's perfect, but she's, pre she's, pretty, she's pretty well close. And she combined just this uncanny ability to get the defining Supreme Court scoops of our time. She was the one who revealed the fact that Chief Justice Roberts changed his vote in the healthcare case with amazing insight and fairness and that sense of, I don't know if it, bipartisan is the right word, but nonpartisan conversations are what Aspen tries to do and what I'm trying to do at the center. So here's why I just got my dream job and feel every day like I'm in constitutional heaven. <laughs> because this national treasure, the National Constitution Center, which you all have to come see, and if you can't come to Philadelphia and see this beautiful I.M. Pei building on Independence Mall with the most gorgeous constitutional views in America, looking out on Independence Hall where the Constitution was drafted, with rare copies of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights. So it's this thrilling museum that was created at a point in time when Congress actually cared about nonpartisanship and has a charter from Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Such a place could never have been created in today's climate. It was just a brief shining moment when people had enough faith in the idea that the Constitution binds people of very different perspectives to create a gorgeous museum to discuss it. But that's not all it is. For me, the, the National Constitution Center is an idea, and it's the idea that people of divergent views can come together not only in Philadelphia, but online and on podcasts, which we're doing every week and getting 300,000 downloads a week without any special promotion. On the Constitution. On the Constitution, just it's every amazing. week. amazing. Which I just I mean, 300,000. People are, people are hungry for constitutional dialogue, and you don't have to dumb it down. Just every week, we are calling up the best liberal and conservative scholars in the country, and they all call into a dial-in line, and it sounds like it's recorded in a bathtub, basically, because it's a landline. <laughs> but I just ask them questions, and the goal is for listeners to hear the best arguments on both sides of all the cases that are riveting the nation. And the reason I'm so passionate about this, and I was as a, t as a law professor, and I still feel like I'm a teacher, is that there are good arguments on both sides of any constitutional question. It's very important for all of us to acknowledge this. This is a divided Supreme Court, and Jan and I can talk about the times when it comes together and the times when it's divided. But don't dismiss out of hand the possibility that any side could deserves respect when it comes to the Constitution. And the other thing that I'm really passionate about is the idea we are not here when we talk about the Constitution to argue about politics. If we talk about politics, we're going to disagree and we're not going to convince each other. But we can talk about the Constitution and acknowledge the fact that there are are good enough arguments on both sides that we have to educate ourselves and then have a conversation. And sometimes we can change our minds. There was a wonderful moment at the Constitution Center. We started up a great debate series with Intelligence Squared, which is the best uh, sort of high-end debate series. And the question was, does the president have the constitutional power to target and kill American citizens abroad? And Alan Dershowitz, of all people, argued in favor of the motion. Yes, the president does have the power. And the audience voted before the show, and they said, no, he doesn't have the power. And after Dershowitz gave the best closing argument I've ever heard, people switched their vote and said, yes, he does have the power. And these are people, and we also said, who, who has a constitutional conclusion that diverges from your political views? And lots of people did. People thought, no, it's a bad idea, but the Constitution allows it. Or the argument on the other side, it's a good idea, but the Constitution prohibits it. This is what you teach in the classroom, but I'm very passionate about introducing this line to students starting in you know, seventh grade for the PSAT, there's a new college board requirement that every kid study and read about the founding documents. And the SAT and the US history and AP exams have a founding documents requirement. So we're doing a partnership with the college board, creating the best interactive constitution on the web where the top liberal and conservatives will write about what they agree about each constitutional provision and what they disagree, and then the college board will distribute that to every school in the country. So I just want, I mean, you can see how keyed up I am about this, because I think it's really important, but the other thing that's beautiful about the Constitution Center is the leadership. So the current chair is Jeb Bush, and the previous chair was Bill Clinton, and the one before that was Bush 41. And um, Jeb Bush gave Hillary our Liberty Medal last year, and Clinton and 41 appeared together on behalf of the Constitution Center, and they are passionate about this idea of constitutional education. 41 said that his service to the center was the most meaningful post-presidential service he performed, which is why Governor Bush agreed to serve. 
So this is a polarized time, and I know how discouraged many of us are about the fact that it seems impossible for Washington to function. But I really believe very earnestly, because I see it in action every day, that people can set aside their differences enough to acknowledge that we are united by our love for these founding documents. And I now am an evangelist, and I have my NCC pocket. You carry that around in your pocket every, all the, everywhere. Mike Bezos <laughs> is going to help me distribute this. He promised he will, and, he's, and we're going to figure out how to do it. And we've got a great uh, new preface uh, about the relationship between the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights that I wrote with David Rubenstein, who has uh, lent us a, a, a Declaration of Independence. And I want every school kid in America to read this. And there's something about the text that we, we, let's, we can have a constitutional conversation about any number of questions, but just bringing out the Constitution, you reading the relevant text. I, I do need need, my glasses. I, should, I left my glasses <laughs> at home too, but if I hold it really far away, or maybe if we do that, I know I, a few of them I can do without reading it. But I think this, this is a, these are documents that bind us, they unite us, whether you are liberal or conservative or Democrat or Republican. This defines us as Americans, and the thing that I want to insist on, we don't have to agree. The Constitution is a conversation that is shaped by people vigorously disagreeing, respectfully, and debating things in constitutional terms, and that is just what I want to do in every media platform at the center around the country, at Aspen, at events like this. It is just the best and most satisfying thing I can think of. And you know, the interesting thing, too, is like you've already had a... Um a majority of the Supreme Court justices come. I mean, some conservative, some liberal. How many of you have had six in the past year or two? I think we've had a majority, and yeah. they've not even divided uh, yet. <laughs> and it's been thrilling. Uh, last week, Justice Alito came to open this beautiful new gallery with one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights, and he gave the most substantive speech, uniting New York and Philadelphia, because we're sharing this document with the New York Public Library for 100 years, and talking about how General Washington thought it was so important for the first Congress that had been in Philadelphia and moved to New York to kind of unite the two capitals. And then he gave this gorgeous metaphor of how the Bill of Rights without the Constitution is like an arm without a body, and then paid beautiful tribute to Bush 41. So that was great. And then uh, a few weeks before that, Justice Kennedy came. And oh, just wait, wait. You may not realize this, but Justice Kennedy, was he nice to you? He was. We, we, <laughs> we, we made up. Jeff it's, has uh, written some articles that... He he it, may not have been so happy with. It's true that it, my role as a journalist is very different from this new <laughs> nonpartisan uh, role as head of the center. And in my callow youth of, you know, I think I was 47, uh, it was youthful indiscretions, I wrote, uh, uh, my job as a journalist was to write some articles, and I, and I wrote one about Justice Kennedy that was really too uh, harsh in retrospect, but he came to the center, and I apologized. I said, you know what, I was a snotty kid. It was, uh, two I years didn't ago. know what I was doing. It was two years ago. I was young. I was young. I needed the money. I'm so sorry, Justice. But it was an earnest apology because, in fact, it was, you know, you know Mike Kinsley said uh, at the New Republic, you should write all of your mean pieces when you're young. Uh, and I, you know, didn't quite uh, follow that <laughs> advice. But it's easy to judge and uh, sort of evaluate people against your pet methodology, it's what the law professors do, but how much more exciting to actually understand people in their own terms and allow them to speak, which is why I like interviewing more than anything else. So Justice Kennedy and I made up, and he just loved the center because he's the leading evangelist on the court for the importance of civic education, and he went to Independence Hall and then came to the center and wrote this beautiful statement about how the Constitution was founded at Independence Hall, and all citizens should look across the mall and understand its, con its contemporary living relevance at the Constitution Center. And he talked to school kids and was just magnificent. And we are, uh, he's my, we're, he, we're, I made him an honorary scholar at the Constitution Center. He's going to do phenomenal stuff for us. And, uh, but, you know, if I could, I mean, one of the things that um, I think is so wonderful is that you're, you're bringing so many of these, you know, I mean, justices and people to talk about the Constitution and, and really bringing it to life. Um, but you're also uh, continuing with your writing, and you had this wonderful piece on Justice Ginsburg. I don't know if, I hope all of you were able to see Jeff's piece last month. Wait, two months. Time flies when you're having fun here. Yes. But a recent piece uh, that he wrote, a, f a fantastic interview he did with Justice Ginsburg, um, which uh, I think he got information for her that I, I don't know that anybody else could have gotten. So you're contributing so much to the debate, not only through what you're doing with the center, but through your ongoing work in journalism. And one of the things I want to ask you uh, is about that article. Um, Justice Ginsburg strikes me in that article, and I think she pretty much confirmed to you, is that she's not going anywhere. 
I mean, she's going to stay on the Supreme Court for as long as she feels she's healthy and able to do the work. And that seems like some people had hoped that she would have stepped down earlier so that the president could nominate her replacement. Does that surprise you? First of all, I just have to say, I just have a wild crush on Justice Ginsburg. <laughs> <laughs> I love her. I lo every moment that I'm in her presence, it's like a, it's like a magic time. <laughs> and, I, and you've known her for a long time. I, I have. I met her um, years ago in 1991. I was a law clerk on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. And she was a judge, and she would come downstairs in a leotard and leggings from this jazzercise <laughs> class. Uh, and that was very popular in those days. So she, at least then especially, she's pretty formidable and rather reserved if you don't know her well. So we'd be in this tiny little elevator in this very regal way in her leggings and leotard. She'd just be <laughs> sitting there very quietly. And I felt like I had to make conversation to break the ice somehow because it would be polite. And I didn't know what to talk about, so I started talking about what I happen to like a lot, which is opera. And as it happens, that's her favorite topic. So she just opened up and blossomed, and we started a lifelong friendship uh, that has been based in our shared love of opera. And uh, in, uh, in the spring, at a National Constitution Center uh, board meeting in DC, we did the world premiere of the superb new opera, Scalia Ginsburg. And this is a brilliant young a uh, graduate of the Yale Music School who went to law school and decided he wants to be an opera composer, and he imagines Scalia and Ginsburg trapped on a desert island, and the only way they can escape is if they agree on a common interpretive methodology. <laughs> so it's really funny and clever, and the lyrics are great, and we had these young, wonderful singers, and then Justice Ginsburg and I played sort of Name That Tune after the show, where she, I said, you come out to Carmen, and she said, yes, but Justice Scalia is from Il Trovatore, and I heard some Dido and Aeneas in there, and anyway, we were really bonding over that. So that set up um, this phenomenal conversation at the court, and then there was a follow-up at Aspen in Washington uh, last week, and she's so, it's so beautiful to see how this woman who I've admired so long, she was known as a judge's judge when she was appointed. Some liberals criticized her, first of all, for saying that Roe v. Wade went too far. You know, she said that the court should have just decided, struck down that extreme Texas law, but not tried to resolve the question for the whole nation, and there might not have been a backlash. So she was criticized for that, and people thought she was cautious and incrementalist. But just in the past few years, she's absolutely on fire. She won, ever since she became the senior associate justice for the liberals, which means that she's the one when, uh, there's a majority for the liberals. She either writes the opinion herself or assigns it to the judge who reflects her views. And she also can either write the lead dissent herself or assign it to the person she thinks will be best. And she's made it her priority to have all the liberals speak with one voice because she told me that after Bush v. Gore, she was concerned that the court was fracturing and people didn't uh, speak uh, in a united fashion. Or in a, compre in a comprehensive fashion. fashion. The, the people, did, <laughs> people didn't know what was going on. I mean, and, yeah, and, 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 the, and the country was confused. And she's just, at, at, she's 81, and she's an internet sensation. There are the, we began by talking about the fact that there are these t-shirts going around with her picture that say, the notorious RBG. <laughs> so I asked her, had you even heard before this t-shirt of who the rapper, the notorious B.I.G. was? And she said her law clerks told her, so <laughs> that she was happy about that. And, and she that, gave you, there's several other t-shirts. There you, is. That she kind of, so she's following all the, the line of fashion that is being developed. She loves it. She, her favorite is, you can't spell truth without Ruth, which is, a, <laughs> which is a very good one. And then there's also, there's also I think there's WWRBGD, what would, what would Ruth Bader Ginsburg do, is another one. But all this is to say that we were, I was just so excited to hear whatever she felt like talking about. And she's so warm and so expansive. And she'll, she's very candid. She'll talk about anything. Well, I she did. was very candid with you. And I thought there was so much in the interview. I mean, I, again, you, you guys have to read this interview because I, it's a Supreme Court junkie. I was just fascinated by it. But, she, you know. She, she, she did talk about retirement, though. Yes. And, I, and why she's not. Why she's not. First, she and made And we also have to set this up because many people um, uh, on the left, even though she's kind of this now the, the voice of the left on the court, um, had hoped that she would step down because they're afraid, obviously, if the Senate were going to go Republican or if uh, a Republican takes the White House in 2016, then you know they would lose that key liberal vote on the court. 
but justices don't often, I think, history shows, really pay attention so much to who's in the White House. Certainly the old Chief Justice didn't, Rehnquist, and she's not. She is not. She said a bunch of interesting things. She said, first of all, I'm going to do the job as long as I can, and right now I'm turning out opinions faster than the chief. She said, it takes him <laughs> six days, and I'm doing it in five. And then she said, I said, are you feeling okay? You know, how's your health? She said, well, every morning I do my push-ups and sit-ups and the Canadian Air Force exercises. And I said, what are the Canadian Air Force exercises? My mom actually knew about them. I guess it was of that generation. She said some lawyer at a tax conference told her I'd never get up without doing the Canadian Air Force exercises. And they're stretching and they say, you know, ladies, if you do these, you'll be toned, but not too muscular. And it's sort of told, <laughs> told women how to stay fit. And she's doing it, working with a trainer she shares with Justice Kagan, who does, Justice Ginsburg told me, boxing to keep out her frustrations. So, so this... Extraordinary and woman. there have been quite a few frustrations for the left. One or two. It requires <laughs> a little bit of boxing. But, you know, she's so petite and elegant, but she's really strong and fit, and she's basically doing calisthenics just the way she did jazzercise in the 80s. So she's really fit and is in great shape. But then I said, you know, some people say you should step down because the seat should go to a liberal. What's your response? And she said, I ask the academics who say I should step down who better than I could the president get through the Senate in this current climate? So that was her response. She thought even when the Democrats had the Senate that no one better than she could be confirmed, and that's why she's sticking to it. She also said, she, she, you know, she said generally O'Connor, Justice O'Connor retired because of her husband, and she suggested in the interview, actually, it was very candid that Justice O'Connor regrets her decision to step down, and Justice Ginsburg said, think of how many cases would have come out differently if Justice O'Connor was still out on the court, and Justice Ginsburg said, I think, I said, what are the worst decisions in your view recently? And she said, Citizens United, and the Commerce Clause part of the health care case, and the voting rights case, and she thought that Justice O'Connor would have been on the opposite side of all of these cases. So she was really quite candid about that as and, well. And of course, as Jeff said, I mean, O'Connor's retirement, um, which uh, was her seat was taken by Justice Alito, who is I think perhaps one of the now strongest conservative voices, uh, at least in terms of clarity on the court, really dramatically shifted uh, the, the court, the balance of power on the court, and changed. I mean, I mean, several cases uh, were reversed. So I thought that was when she was talking about that in your interview um, and how Justice her O'Connor's retirement. People talk about this being the robber's court, and they want to know how is the new chief justice different than the predecessor, Chief Justice William Rehnquist. But her point was there are you know, six of one, half dozen of the other, but the real distinction and difference was when Justice Alito came on and took Justice O'Connor's place. And it's interesting to see how she's, that seems to be affecting her thinking about her future, too. She's keenly aware of that. Keenly aware. You're exactly right. She said, just as you suggested, that the key change was O'Connor. And I asked her, do you think that Chief Justice Roberts will achieve his goal of narrow unanimous opinions? Because he, in a bunch of interviews, including one I had, was lucky enough to have with him at the end of his first term, said he wanted, he thought these five to four decisions were bad for the court and bad for the country, and he wanted to make it his mission to get his colleagues to converge around narrow unanimous opinions. And he had some success last year with that. 66% of the cases were unanimous, the highest rate since the 40s. So I asked Justice Ginsburg, is he succeeding? And she said, well, you know, there were, some of those cases were unanimous, but they masked serious disagreement about the reasoning, like the case about the president's recess appointments or the abortion protest bubbles, where they converged on the result but disagreed about the reasoning. And then she noted the many five to four decisions along ideological lines, like the Hobby Lobby case, where she accused her male colleagues after the decision came down of having a blind spot when it came to women and expressed great concern that that case would lead people to seek religious exemptions from anti-discrimination laws. So I got the sense from that interview that she, a little bit, maybe even more than her colleagues, Justices Kagan and Breyer, who have been more inclined to reach across the aisle and compromise with Chief Justice Roberts, she really views herself as the keeper of the liberal flame. And although she, much, she respects and likes Chief Justice Roberts very much, I think she's not so convinced that the court is going to be uh, unanimous in a lot of cases. And it does seem that in the cases that we all write about and read about, kind of those big hot-button social issue cases, uh, they're 5-4. So what, what are the 
um, so you, the, the, well, the, the it's nice to have unanimity on you know kind of obscure uh, cases that we may not follow as closely. I mean, out of the hundred, I mean, out of the eighty-five, eighty cases the court takes up a year, about ten of them really are the ones that we pay close attention to and, and talk about for years to come. We thought this term was going to be rather quiet um, as to, after having several terms in past years, as you guys know, that were just blockbusters. Um, but now it looks like the court is heating back up again with yet another challenge to the president's health care law and now a, a looming challenge to bans on same-sex marriage. So let's think together, because you know more about the chief than anyone else, about how the chief, who I think we both really respect tremendously, might vote in these upcoming cases. So in the health care case, which was an exception to the five to four Republicans and Democrats, uh, my sense from your reporting and from reading the opinions and from going back and reading my interview with him and the things he said to others, the reason that he voted to uphold the health care law as a tax is because he was concerned about the institutional legitimacy of the court. He thinks, as he said, that it's bad for the court and bad for the country for the, to see five Democrats five Republicans and four Democrats. And he said he hoped it would be said of his major decisions that many of them showed a concern with institutional legitimacy rather than ideological purity. So before we go on to the current cases, is that, a, is that your understanding of why he voted the way he did? Yes, I mean, I think he's, he, and, and I think to your point earlier about what you're doing at the Constitution Center, this is a, a very good example of, I think, why what you're doing is so important because this was a case, if you think back to that massive challenge to the president's health care law, where literally every, well, not literally everyone, but almost everyone was predicting 8172, that this, there was absolutely no question, there were no legitimate arguments uh, that, that were even within the realm of like rational thought that the president's health care law, of course, that was going to be upheld. And if you recall, after that argument, when there were actually quite serious arguments raised by the attorneys and the justices were receptive to that challenge, uh, people were stunned. They'd not even considered that there could possibly be good constitutional or legal arguments uh, against the law. Um, and of course, with Robert switching his vote, providing that key fifth vote uh, with the, the left uh, was a huge blow to conservatives who had been somewhat wary of Roberts when he went on the Supreme Court as Chief Justice. They were not quite sure he was going to be that solid conservative. I think he is, and I think it's a mistake to read his vote in that case as anything other than his vote in that case, and certainly not an indication that he's gotten soft or he's going to be some kind of closet liberal. And so I would be somewhat, um, I would be somewhat surprised if he voted with the liberals in this challenge. I think he's much more willing and would the arguments in this case are going to be he's going to find much more appealing for the challengers i think you're right about this current health care challenge which as you know involves uh, it seems hyper technical uh, the question is quite legalistic but really important whether and i think i think you could say that th this current challenge is as significant as the one from two years ago and if, if the challengers prevail the impact on the law would be just as devastating. It would potentially, the law would just collapse, I think, under its weight. So just to give in my Constitution Center style the arguments on both sides, <laughs> the question is whether Section 1311 of the Act, which says that uh, subsidies can only go to exchanges created by a state, means what it says, or whether the IRS can also give subsidies to exchanges that are created by the federal government. So as it turns out, 36 states have created uh, exchanges, but the rest have not. Other, uh, oh, sorry, other way. Forget, other way. 36 uh, uh, states have not created it. Right, and, and so they do that healthcare.gov. Go right, they're it. getting it through the federal exchange. Only 19 states have created it. So the clear text of the law says the exchange has to be created by a state to get the subsidy. And then there's a question of what Congress intended when it passed this law, and the people who are arguing that the IRS was wrong to extend it to federal subsidies say that Congress, including the Democrats, wanted to basically threaten the states that if you don't create the exchanges, you won't get the subsidy. The argument on the other side is that this is ridiculous, that the Democrats would never have tried to drive a stake through the heart of the health care law, that they, it was a drafting era, essentially, and if you look at it in context, 
Um, no one anticipated that the states wouldn't create exchanges, and therefore you shouldn't read the text to mean what it says. So as Jan suggests, Chief Justice Roberts, who cares so much about textualism, as we saw in the healthcare case where he voted to uphold the mandate as a tax because the Congress, the Constitution allows Congress to tax, might well be moved by the argument that the law means what it says. How dramatic for someone who had sort of staked his reputation on institutional legitimacy and upholding the mandate to cast a decisive vote, striking down these exchanges, which would mean that five million people who are now on the exchanges would be uninsured and would have very dramatic consequences. So that's the healthcare case. But then at the same time, on th that was, uh, the court took that up on Friday, last Thursday, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld bans on gay marriage, making it quite likely that the court will decide the gay marriage case this year. And again, let's think through this together. I think this was probably a case that Chief Justice Roberts might have preferred that the court not take. I absolutely. This year. I think I and I, I'm not sure that anyone really wanted to take those cases. I mean, Justice Ginsburg suggested over the summer they were happy just to sit back and wait until a conflict, and I'm sure they were hoping there wouldn't be one. As they suggested just a few weeks ago by uh, affirming without comment the decision of four federal courts to extend gay marriage across those circuits. So think about Chief Justice Roberts, and, for, and for, this is a man whose hero is John Marshall. He, in his office, there's a portrait of the great Chief Justice, and Marshall, as Roberts told me in this wonderful interview, was so successful not only because of his brilliance, but because of his temperament, because his colleagues liked and trusted him, and because he was a great strategist. He was the one who, in Marbury versus Madison, uh, avoided a conflict with President Jefferson that he knew he'd lose because he said he wasn't fond of butting his head against a wall in sport, but in the, in the same time that he handed a temporary victory to Jefferson, he expanded the court's power over the long term, and that's what Roberts did in the healthcare case. Here in the marriage equality cases, this is a dilemma because Roberts knows that history is moving in favor of marriage equality, and like Judge Jeffrey Sutton, whose opinion is really worth reading, uh, just as a civic exercise, I, I commend it to you because Judge Sutton, who is a conservative judge, a respected conservative, who upheld the health care law originally because he believes in judicial restraint, here said that judicial restraint counsels letting the people decide the marriage question on their own. And he provided a sort of template for Roberts, if Roberts chooses to go that way too. But Roberts might be thinking strategically, well, does he want to be on the wrong side of history to be one of four dissenters uh, in a case that will be looked at for a century in the future as the Brown versus Board of Education of marriage equality? Or does he really believe in judicial restraint and not feel able to compromise his views? It's a really tough situation to What be do you in. think? Yeah, I don't, well, I'm just Come the head on, of the yeah, Constitution yeah. Center. I don't make <laughs> predictions about Supreme Court cases <laughs> anymore. That one I, I wouldn't presume to Yeah, I think that's call. a really tough that's question. That's a really tough one. But, you know, already it's, I mean, this is now shaping out to be yet another momentous term. Yeah. And you think we will have no retirements? Oh, you know much more about that than I, but it, uh, it doesn't look like it. Well, we certainly know from reading your article that Justice Ginsburg is fit and fast and not going anywhere. Ready to go, and I, I introduced her as the great RBG, and she said, the notorious RBG. <laughs> <laughs> I know um, you all, we wanted to have some questions from the audience, and I know that you all must have so many things that you want to um, talk to Jeff about. Um, would, I'm going to just, let's just all have a conversation here together. Is anybody... Uh, Anyone want to? Yes, sir. On, on where the right-leaning justices want to lead this country. I think that each of, it's, uh, each of them has a principal judicial philosophy, and they're quite different from each other. So we really can't. One of the great virtues of Jan's book is to take each justice on his or her own terms and illuminate the fact that in their minds they're driven not by politics, but by constitutional methodology. So Justice Scalia uh, is uh, a textualist, he says, and he believes first you do what the text says, and only if the text is unclear do you look at the original understanding. Justice Thomas uh, is even more extreme in his devotion to original understanding, and Justice Scalia has said the difference between me and Thomas is that Thomas would overturn any decision he thinks is inconsistent with original understanding. I wouldn't do that, says Scalia, because I'm not a nut. <laughs> and he meant that in an affectionate sense. I mean, he, Thomas is even more principled. Justices Alito and Roberts are quite different. Uh, 
Justice Roberts, I think, is quite devoted to this Holmesian idea of judicial restraint, of deferring to uh, the democratic process when possible. And his mentality was shaped in the uh, Reagan White House Counsel's Office, so he's quite pro-executive power. Justice Alito cares a lot about privacy. He's written some fascinating lone dissents. The court, eight to one, uh, strikes down or allows those very offensive protests at uh, funerals by anti-gay uh, protesters and Alito dissents on privacy grounds. So his sensibility is different. And Kennedy, of course, is a great libertarian. He believes passionately in a sort of expansive vision of individual dignity and autonomy is at the center He's of the Constitution. He's wonderful, isn't he? He's superb. <laughs> well, he, no, he is wonderful. And when you see how earnestly he thinks that it's the court's duty to protect the dignity of all Americans, regardless of sexual orientation or, or race or gender, it's sort of inspiring. There's an interesting new book out uh, by a guy at the Cato Institute saying the war between um, pro-executive power and social conservatives and libertarian conservatives has defined the jurisprudential wars on the court for a long time. And I think it's still being played out. So that's a long way of saying that they want different things. Now, that's not to mean that they don't have some shared goals. And it's certainly true that in the healthcare case, the fact that all five of them converged on a vision of limited power under the Commerce Clause that could cut back on federal power and along a range of areas is significant. And Justice Ginsburg thinks that that's the real difference between the liberals and conservatives, that the conservatives do believe that Congress's enumerated power should be enforced by the court and that some of the regulatory state is unconstitutional. And Chief Justice Roberts told me that too. He said, you know, I'm t I believe in legitimacy, and, but, uh, but I have views and strong views and I'm not gonna compromise them. So just as Chief Justice Marshall believed in a strong power of independent courts, their ability to strike down unconstitutional laws and on the ability of the Congress to regulate the national economy, I think Roberts believes that judges should not make up unenumerated rights. So he's pr not a fan according to Justice uh, Stevens in a public interview of Roe v. Wade. Um, and he also believes in some limits on government power. But I, I you know, it's, uh, many of the justices are asked, and people often bristle, you know, when Justice Thomas speaks to school kids, a smart kid will always raise his or her hand and say, you know, isn't it all politics on the Supreme Court? Aren't you just voting your politics? And Thomas says, I've never heard a word of politics exchanged. None of the justices view things that way. And I think all the justices believe, at least, in their own minds, that they really are moved more by constitutional philosophy than politics. But when you think about constitutional philosophy and methods of uh, interpreting the Constitution, which you're obviously exploring at the center, um, again, continuing on the devil's advocate theme, and I know there are some appeals court judges who make this point, Conservatives have a method of interpreting the Constitution. Liberals have a method of interpreting the Constitution. What, who's to say that that's just not so that they get the result they want? It's a powerful challenge, and it's the challenge that my students ask on the first day of con law class, that when you look at the statistics, sure, there are some cases where justices' politics diverge from their constitutional views, like Justice Scalia voting to uphold flag burning, which is a good example. There aren't that many, and you know the majority of cases there's a, the two coincide. So, and then, and then there are cases like Bush v. Gore where the liberal justices literally accuse the conservatives of having it be all politics. So what's well, Wasn't that an interesting one? Because the liberal justices took positions in some ways at odds with where they would be interpreting the Constitution, recognizing perhaps a new right. The conservatives, you know, took the other position. They did. They I'd, flipped. There's no, no one has a monopoly of virtue here. But I've And made, that was a real, I mean, obviously Bush versus Gore um, uh, was a real black eye for the court. Although, you know, the justices, when I've spoken with them, even Justice O'Connor will say that um, they wish they'd had more time, as Ginsburg suggested to you, but they would have still come, the, come out the same way. Yes. Um, so I think the answer, what I tell the students is, and I'm going to say this to you now, and you can see if you find it convincing, don't assume it's all politics. Because if you're that cynical and you think everything is just a fig leaf for uh, political results, then you miss everything that is beautiful and constraining and inspiring and meaningful about constitutional law. And there are many cases where you can see justices 
motivated by methodologies rather than political results. And the fact that this Supreme Court is one that uh, unlike courts in Eastern Europe or even in emerging democracies, no one, the executive can't call up, can't call them up and ask for a particular result. It's not telephone justice. You know that they're independent. And, you, and there are significant cases where someone like Chief Justice Roberts can reach a result in the healthcare case like the one he did. That's important and meaningful. So, you know, Justice Breyer also answered this well uh, at a Constitution Center event. He said there are some cases where you feel so strongly about the constitutional stakes you're not gonna persuade the other side. Abortion, affirmative action, gay rights, people have strong preconditions. They believe their constitutional positions, not political ones, but they're not gonna budge. But he said in a, in a statutory case, or a case involving a complicated question of uh, technical interpretation, people do change each other's minds. They are unanimous. Jan reported in her great book about cases where Justice Thomas had changed the views of his colleagues. And those are meaningful. So it's just too simplistic to pick the handful of the most salient cases and say that stands for the whole, I think just as important are the exceptions. Um, anyway, that's why I'm in the business I am. If I, if I didn't believe that, then I wouldn't be an evangelist for nonpartisan constitutional interpretation. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm just curious, I don't want to try to turn you into the next sort of constitutional uh -oh. scholars. Um, but there's, there's clearly a case headed to the court where two circuits have split in the Second Circuit and the D.C. Circuit around the NSA data gathering. Um, I mean, that case clearly has to go to the Supreme Court. Um, uh, I don't think it's, it's not in for this, this term yet, but I suspect it will be. Um, um, and I'm curious to know how you would anticipate the court dealing with that. I don't mean the result, but how do you, how do you anticipate them dealing with this very tricky privacy and constitutional and, 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 and political governmental issue. Thank you for the wonderful question. As a privacy guy, this is sort of my favorite constitutional case. And it's so rich because this is a case, and it also fits in well to the last question. This is a case where conservatives and liberals often can agree. The question of digital privacy came up last year, and the question was, can the cops, when they arrest me, you, whoever it is, can they take our cell phones and read everything inside? And previous cases it said when you arrest someone, you can take anything that's on their person, including a cigarette package, and open it up and check for weapons uh, to protect the officer. And the lower court said a cell phone is like a cigarette packet. In a unanimous decision, nine to zero, written by Chief Justice Roberts, the court disagreed. Chief Justice Roberts said a cell phone is nothing like a cigarette packet. It contains our hopes, our fears, the records of the people we associate with, our movements. And then he quoted the story of the general warrants and writs of assistance that sparked the American Revolution. This is so inspiring. And James Otis in 1763 is denouncing these writs of assistance that let the king's agents break into people's houses to see if they're paying the hated taxes on tea. And John Adams says, at that moment, the child independence was born, the moment that James Otis denounces the writs of assistance. And Roberts quotes that in saying that suspicionless searches that allow the government to look at a lot of data without particularized suspicion are like the general warrants and violate the Constitution. So that sets up our ways of thinking about how the court might confront NSA surveillance. You can argue this round or flat, but um, on the one hand, the court might say, uh, suspicionless searches of our cell phone metadata is just like the general warrants too. Every phone call in and out of the United States reveals even more information than the search of a cell phone and the framers hated suspicionless searches and therefore uh, you'd need some degree of individualized suspicion. The argument on the other side is a case from the 1970s called Smith versus Maryland where the court said that when you dial a local phone company you're voluntarily surrendering the number to the phone company and you've abandoned all expectation of privacy in it. And as long as that case remains on the books, then not only can the government seize our, cell, our local phone records, but any data that we turn over to a third party, like when I walk down the street, my movements are recorded by whatever my carrier is, Verizon or AT&T, and according to this doctrine, I voluntarily surrendered the records of my movements and the government could reconstruct my movements 24-7 and trace where I've been going every moment for a month. 
Justice Sotomayor, in a really exciting concurrence in a case involving global positioning system surveillance, said the court has to reconsider this entire doctrine. It's called the third party doctrine that says when I surrender information to a third party, I lose expectation of privacy in it. And that was also a case where basically five justices said it is absolutely an unreasonable search and seizure to follow someone for a month and reconstruct all their movements because you can learn so much about them. So the NSA case is so rich and interesting because you can argue it round or flat. The court may have to confront the third party doctrine and also confront the question of whether you can learn as much about someone just from their local telephone numbers as you can from reconstructing all of their movements. But I'm inspired that it was Justice Scalia who wrote a great dissent in a case involving DNA surveillance. He joined the liberals there that all nine of them struck down GPS surveillance and cell phone surveillance. I, hear, they, I gave a lame answer to your question, is it all politics? Here, this is the best example of how it's not all politics, because believe me, Justice Scalia, as he said, doesn't like freeing drug dealers, which is what happened in the GPS case. But these justices are so devoted to translating the Constitution in light of new technologies and taking these old analogies of general warrants and uh, making them relevant in the modern age that although I'm not predicting, I can't be Nate Silver because you could go either way on this case. Um, first of all, I wouldn't be very good, but, but all, you know, it depends if they're willing to re-examine the, these old doctrines. But I hope they will, and I'll say one more thing. We had a really thrilling two days at the Constitution Center last week. Every week is a constitutional thrill, but here 30 <laughs> federal judges came to discuss the constitutional legacy of James Madison. And judges Diana Wood and Kent Jordan, the leading liberal and conservative Justices gave a public presentation on Madison, and then the judges talked among themselves about cases like NSA surveillance. And I certainly can't reveal what was said, except to say the creativity and enthusiasm of trying to grapple with these totally open questions about which there are no right answers under current laws was inspiring. And they had a conversation much like the one we're having now, where they tested out the arguments on both sides and tried to imagine how to translate the framers' values in this new world. So I will say, non-partisan or not, I hope the court will recognize that warrantless surveillance, in my view, is like the general warrants that sparked the American Revolution, but we will see what they, what they do. Thank you for the question. Yes. Oh, hope. In countries and in industries, there, there are often paradigm shifts based on cultural norms or technology, just innovations that change the way people do certain things. I'm wondering if you feel that something like that has happened recently in the landscape of constitutional law, whether it's the way that individuals or justices or judges or lawyers interact with the Constitution based on changes that have happened throughout society. Such a great question. It's such a good question. I asked Justice Ginsburg a version of this. Basically, we were talking about the marriage equality cases, and I said, how did you know, do the justices follow the polls? Uh, do they uh, channel public opinion? You know, how do you interact with shifting social norms? And first she said, look, we are not that tech savvy, but then she pulled out her purse. It was so adorable. This was the Aspen um, interview. And she said, I have two iPhones. And I can't find either of them, but she, she showed her iPhones. And, you know, some of them text, and then they read their briefs online. And although Justice Kagan said she's the youngest justice, and her video game was Pong, you know, she's of my <laughs> generation. They, 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 they read, Justice Kagan reads blogs and so forth. But Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg gave the most beautiful answer. She said, what we try to pay attention to is not the weather of the day, but the climate of the era, which was a nice way of putting it. And it's not a syllogism. It doesn't exactly tell you when the court is ready to intervene on marriage equality, but it's kind of a gestalt, and you know it when you see it, and they're very sensitive to not getting too far ahead or too far behind, but they're sensitive to needing to reflect constitutional views. Um, and then she, uh, another sea change that she identified is technology. And she noted that when the justices can view their own privacy as being at risk, they're more likely to take account of these new technologies. That was her account of why the court ruled as it did in the cell phone case. And she noted that moment in the global positioning system case where the Obama administration stands up and says, we believe based on past cases that citizens have no expectation of privacy in public and you all have to assume the risk that you're being followed at any time. And Chief Justice Roberts said, is it your position, uh, General, that 
the, 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 the president could put a GPS device on the bottom of the cars of the members of this court and track our movements? And the lawyer said yes, and Ginsburg said at that moment, he lost the case. <laughs> Basically, you know, that, and, and when the justices can visualize it, as they can, we're all living online now, and they are too, I think it's a complete sea change. And that's why it may not take, just as, the, I mean, the marriage equality thing is stunning. Even Sutton's decision upholding the marriage ban notes how quickly the polls and the constitutional understanding have changed and the fact that every other lower federal court has struck down the bans. This would have been unthinkable two years ago. And it's so striking to see how fast, not just polls, but understandings change, there are tipping points, and the justices are aware of that. Um, in the marriage equality case, and Ginsburg talked about this too, this, this Aspen interview is totally worth just seeing because she was candid and magnificent. She talked about people changing their minds based on the, uh, either knowing someone who's gay or uh, guys changing their mind based on the intervention of their wives or daughters. And, uh, and that's what happened to President Obama and there's a sociologist, Jonathan Haidt, who's confirmed that much of the change among men, straight men, has come because of that phenomenon. But just the justices are aware of this, and it's reflected. Now, there's an argument on the other side. Justice Scalia would say, this is appalling. There's no business that judges have reading the polls or trying to figure out gestalt. And he says, I don't believe in a living constitution. I believe in a dead constitution. He's sort of half-joking, but he says, you should construe it in light of original understanding and nothing else. And that's an important debate that is taking place on the court, uh, but it's one that the justices are very actively having. Okay, one more question. Sadly, we have to end it with this one. So I'll, you in the middle there? I'll, when you talk about um, Robert's decision to kind of keep the court more in line, and that's the way he ruled, um, in terms of the health care, the original um, case about it. Do you feel that it's a judge's or a chief justice's duty to kind of align the court more when maybe his constitutional beliefs fall the other way? Do you think that that ever comes into conflict uh, in his decision-making process? That's such a great and important question, too. Is it appropriate, you're asking, for a chief justice to consider the institutional legitimacy of the court, or should he or she simply vote what he thinks the Constitution requires and let the heavens fall, as the lawyers say. Uh, again, we could have a good long discussion about that. From the Chief Justice's point of view, he suggested to me in our interview, he might have voted differently if he were an Associate Justice than Chief. He thinks the Chief has a unique responsibility to tend to the institutional legitimacy of the court because he said the legitimacy is fragile and the Justices talk about it. They are deeply conscious of the fact that they have neither purse nor sword, to use Hamilton's memorable phrase in Federalist uh, 78. Uh, the justices remember the time in Cooper and Aaron when they told Governor Faubus to let those kids into the school at Little Rock, those African-American kids, and they were so afraid that Eisenhower wouldn't back up their decision that they personally signed their decision in ink. Basically, they had no power, but they were trying to say, we really mean it and we're the Supreme Court. So I think aware of that fragility in my view, Roberts, like John Marshall, was correct to balance constitutional with institutional considerations, not to embrace a position he didn't believe, because I'm sure the tax argument was plausible, just as there's a plausible argument for almost any case. But at the same time that he was picking among competing plausible arguments, to have a sense that in this democracy, it is so important, as he said, and this is so moving, and I really believe it so strongly as he does, for citizens in this polarized age when Congress and the president are at each other's throats and there's cable news and no one has faith in politics, for there to be at least the possibility of faith that one institution of government can transcend partisanship and try to be moved by law rather than reason, really, reason rather than politics. So I hope he continues to have these institutional uh, judgments. It's very tough, it's subtle, and challenging, but it's a magnificent court. It's exciting to study it, it's wonderful to talk about it with you, and I want to end by thanking Lori once again, and Jan, and encouraging you to educate yourself about the Constitution, so you don't have to be a lawyer, many of you, I hope to God, are not, uh, <laughs> but you have a, 
an opportunity as citizens to do this. So go to the Supreme Court website, pick an argument you're interested in, like that GPS case, read the oral arguments, read the decisions when they come down, read the briefs, you can skim it, you don't have to read every word. And now, even better, constitutioncenter.org, listen to the podcast, read the, see the videos of our wonderful town hall programs. If you're in Philadelphia, please come say hi, and I'll show you around and show you the documents. We just have such, it's such a privilege that we all have as citizens to educate ourselves about these beautiful documents that bind us and thanks so much for sharing this with me. That was awesome. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you to Jeff and Jan for an amazing conversation. We're all going to get our copies for our next dinner party discussion. And um, Jeff will find out how to get those. You and Mike will let us know. Thank you all for coming.